beginning our series on, uh, well, difficult conversations around topics we like to avoid. Um, yeah, what's going on with that? Why are, why are we in that? We're talking about, well, over the next several weeks, we're going to be talking about things that are definitely part of your daily life. Whether they're like internal issues that actually affect the people around you and, and, and even affect us at a societal level, or they are societal issues that affect us at a personal level and a community level. These are things that you face and you talk about and you hear about and, and you're blasted with all over the place every day. And my heart, just so you know, my heart for us in this isn't so that Pastor Mike gets up here and just, hey, tells you what I think. I want us to press into the Word of God in, in all these ways because if we can't talk about these things here, then that, that leaves us really hung out to dry. That leaves, that leaves you in a really bad position because you're definitely going to hear, hear it in every other place in your life. So, so you, got, you got Ephesians chapter 4, right? Okay, now, don't go back to Psalm 50. Okay, put your, put your uh, what I want you to do for now is I just want you to listen. I want you, if you can kind of set your Bible aside or, or, or close it, or something, you got those pages marked good. I just want you to listen to Psalm 50. And then we're going to move on and we're going to read through Ephesians 4 together. Okay? Hear the word of the Lord. The Mighty One, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes. He will not keep silence. Before him is a devouring fire, and around him is a mighty tempest. He calls out to the heavens above and, and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me, my, my faithful ones, who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God. Not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you. Your burnt offerings are continually before me, but I will not accept a bull from your house or goats from your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine. The cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills and, and all that moves in the field is mine. If I was hungry, I wouldn't tell you. For the world and its fullness are mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls? Do I drink the blood of goats? But offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving to God. Pay your vows to the Most High. Cry out in your day of trouble and I will deliver you and you will glorify me. But to the wicked, God says, what right have you to recite my statutes and to take your co my covenant upon your lips? For you hate discipline. You, you cast my words behind you. If you see a thief, you are pleased with him, and you're, you keep company with adulterers. You give your mouth free rein for evil, and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done. And I was silent. You thought I was just like you. But now I rebuke you. And I, and I lay the charge before you. Mark then, you who forget God, 
lest I tear you apart and there won't be anybody to deliver. The one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. To one who orders his way rightly, I will show the salvation of God. Now hear these words from from the Apostle Paul in the letter to the Ephesians. We're starting it in chapter 4, verse 20. That is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice, but be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. This is the word of the Lord. Pray with me. God, as you search the depths of our hearts and you know us better than we know ourselves, Lord, you, you show us on the one hand how seriously you take these matters, and on the other hand, you show us the way forward through Christ. Lord, change our lives. <laughs> Graciously pour out your Spirit and and not only release us uh, of our sin, but show us the way of freedom in Christ. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. That psalm's pretty heavy, isn't it? Let me ask you something. For those of you who have children, and for those of you who don't, just think of someone that you deep, who you most deeply care about. If someone was destroying the reputation of your child, what would your response be? How would you feel about that? Is there some reason that we think God is going to think it's no big deal. Is there any reason for that? Why are we talking about this? We're talking about this because because God takes it very seriously. We're talking about slander today. Slander is where, uh, and I know that we talked, that the, the scriptures talked about a lot of different things, but slander and abusive speech and these, these sorts of things, what they're, what they're acts of destruction of someone's name and reputation. We, we make them, when we do this, we make that a, another person to be the villain. Through, whether it's through, through outright lies or falsehoods or just gossip, just passing along information that's going to be harmful. We're talking about this because God takes it really seriously. When we slander others, we defame God. 
and we demean those who are made in his image. And my friends, all too often, even those who are brothers and sisters in Christ. But it's also this. When I say the word slander, who do you immediately think of? I mean, there's no right answer to that. But I'll bet you that as soon as you start thinking about that, you're not thinking of yourself. You're thinking of somebody else who may have done that to you. Or someone else that is worse than you. We avoid this issue by deflection. We avoid it by pretending that we are better than other people. So the little ways that I do it aren't as big a deal as the, the bigger ways that they do it. It's kind of the truth. I think that's the truth, isn't it? We live in a world where that's not only okay, but it's applauded. Don't we? It's praiseworthy. Whether it's, whether it's through social media or TV or the news or, or <laughs> in a corner in the church lobby. We, we, we have converse, personal conversations and we say things when, we're, when someone disagrees with us politically or we feel hurt or under threat or just if we don't get our own way. We have all these ways of rationalizing slander. We don't consider how very seriously God takes this. Now, there's a ton to unpack in the psalm and, and, and Ephesians. We're... We're not going to unpack all of that. We're, going to take, we're really going to focus in on a few things. But all the, all the things that, all the sins that the Psalm and, and Ephesians 4 actually put their fingers on, they all really go back to the same root. They make the fundamental mistake of believing that we, we don't need God. Because God is just like us. We, I mean, more, I guess more specifically, we don't need to become like God because God is just like us. We're already there. That's what all these sins assume. Anger and bitterness and wrath and slander and abuse, these, these abusive sorts of things. So let's look at just two things today. How is what I just said true? That slander is a way that we, that we enact unbelief in God. That we, we don't have to become like God and we try to drag God down to our level. How is that actually true? And what is the remedy? So just two things today. Now, this is why I had you actually turn to Psalm 50, if, you're, if, if you still have it. Um, let's look at it. You see, what, what God is, is going after, he calls, he calls the people of Israel his faithful ones, but we, we find really quickly that they're not, right? There's a problem that, that God addresses first with their worship. Now, this is super anachronistic. This is like taking, what I mean is taking the terms we would use today and shoving it back on, on them. They wouldn't have ever used these terms. But basically what it sounds like is that these are people who come before God dressed up real nice for Sunday morning. They look pretty good. They look pretty good from the outside. But for some reason, God says he will not accept their sacrifices. Why? I mean, think of what God said. If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. What does that tell you about the way they were approaching God? As though he needed them, right? As though his commands were just there to, to pile on and to impose in their lives so that they could do something for him. There's a big problem with that, with that sort of worship. God didn't command sacrifices so that he could eat. That's what he's spelling out, right? 
He commanded sacrifices so that the people would have a way of actually being in his presence. So there's a problem with worship. But a problem with worship is most often seen in the other days of the week. I don't think we realize that very often. I think sometimes we we so separate what we do here together and before God from everything we do from the in the rest of the week. We don't realize that a, that the problems that come up there are really problems that have probably begun here. The belief that God needed or, dep- or depended on them it works out in so in just a bunch of different ways. And and we get it all turned around, right? We 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 get ourselves all all kind of all kinds of worked up and we act we act like God is either not there or God is not God during the week. How does how does God sum up the whole problem? In verse verse 21 You thought I was just like you. Now, some of your translations, the ESV that we use says, you thought I was one like yourself. That's a terrible way to translate that. It doesn't even sound like good English. You thought I was just like you, is what it's saying. You thought I wanted sacrifices because I needed you. And you thought, because I was silent as you did all these things, that somehow I approved. How does the way we see God relate to something like slander? Let's look at that from from the what what we like to talk about, as we like to say, the root to the fruit, from our heart all the way to where it actually comes out, okay? There's a direct line. God, the belief that God needs me and approves of what, I'm, what I do and I say because he is just like me leads us to believe that his commands, like we just talked about a few minutes ago, they're an imposition. That he's willing to hang you out to dry so that he can get what he wants. And if that's true, if God's like that, then what security do I have? I don't have any. I never know that God actually wants me or or loves me. All I can do is make myself out to, to be a relatively good person. But in order to do that, I basically have to drag you down a few pegs. Because the truth of the matter is I'm not a better person. (laughs) I'm just not. But somehow, someway, I have to justify my own existence. Because God, because I don't believe God has done it, I have to do it myself. And I'm going to do it by dragging your reputation down. From the root to the fruit. But even though we operate on that level and we see others operating on that level and as a, in, in the world, we operate on that level and, and we get caught up in it too. We care about particular issues a lot and we, and we confuse that passion with, with reason to be able to tear somebody else down. But that belief, that, that belief that we just outlined about God and ourselves, those are false beliefs. Those are false. Look, let's turn to Ephesians 4, okay? Because this is where, this is where we get the flip side of that. What, did, what does Paul say? How does Paul say that we learned Christ? Now, right before that, I know that we picked up right in the middle of a paragraph. So um, he was saying, you know, don't, 
Don't walk as the Gentiles do. Don't do all these things. In the, it, it's futile. It's, they're working out of a different way of life. They're working, they're, they have not experienced the life of God. They're alienated from it. Don't live like that. Because that's not the way you learn Christ. How did you learn Christ? This is how. Verse 22, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. Be renewed in the spirit of your minds and put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Put off the old Put on the new. And, and that, that, that phrase in verse 24, created after the likeness of God, connect that to what we've already been, what we've just been talking about. In the psalm, God, God rebukes the people because you thought I was just like you. Paul's saying, put on new life where you become like God. Where you, through Jesus, in true righteousness and holiness, you, you are created after the likeness of God. You're, you're restored. The, the image of God in you that God created you with is restored fully in Christ. In verse, in that last verse that we read in chapter 5, verse 1, it extends that even a little bit further. Be imitators of God. Be imitators of God as beloved children. <laughs> I love that phrase. I love that as beloved children. Not because he needs us, but because we need him and because we're loved. The standard that God sets is his grace. Think about what God said he wanted in the psalm. Offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving to me. Cry out to me in your day of trouble. Then you'll glorify me. I'll deliver you and you will glorify me. Cry out. Cry out so I can be the Savior. That's what he wants. And he wants to fill us with that gratitude. It's... The standard is his grace. Paul talks about, like we talk, said before, he talks about a whole lot of, of super important stuff here. But I think he really sums up everything he's getting at in terms of, like, as he's defining what it means to put on the new self. He, he, he sums it up in verses 31 and 32. So put off... Put off bitterness, put off wrath, put off anger and clamor and slander along with all malice. All these things are abusive ways of speaking. Ways of destroying another person. Put on kindness, tenderheartedness. Forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. The, the, the word translated forgive there is not the normal one that, that you see in the New Testament. It's, it actually is, it, it, the, the, the nuance there is to give grace. I mean, forgiveness is, is the right translation here, it's, but, but it's a little bit of a different nuance. Graciously forgive as God in Christ forgave you. grace. Let your, let, your, let your speech be full of it for all those who hear. Grace. Just to, just to clarify things, God let his own son be slandered and reviled and dragged through the mud to save you and to save me. It's only when we realize God's grace and his desire to save that the ugliness of our willingness to trample on other people really comes out. Like, we act, well, it's not where it comes out. It's where we see it for what it is. It gets exposed. It is an offense against God's glory and God's reputation 
for his children to slander another person. Let me say that again. It is an offense against God's glory and his reputation for his children to slander another person. Makes the twofold mistake of thinking that God doesn't care and that he's going to sit idly by. I think the psalm made it pretty clear he's not going to do that. Those people that we see as our enemy are made in God's image. Some, some that we slander have been bought by the blood of Jesus. Again, I want to ask you this. If your children were being slandered, what would you do? If your children were, their reputation was being destroyed, what would you do? We live in a a moment of anger and anxiety and and division. What if God's people were very different in this time? What if we were really different? What if, what if we lived in, in the security and we lived according to the standard of God's grace? How would our conversations be different? How might we undercut any accusations of God's people being hypocrites? How can we put off the old self? that sometimes feels that need to slander. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about how. I'm going to ask you to pray again. I asked you a little, bit, a little while ago to start considering this. But I want you to pray. I, I, I'm going to ask you to pray a prayer that's scary. God, reveal my heart. How often... Do you feel justified in talking about that person? You know the one I'm talking about. You know the one I'm talking about. What ways have you rationalized what you've thought and what you've said? Pray about these things. Pray for God to unveil them. Now, we're not doing that just so that we'll say, okay, well, i got to have a better attitude so when I have that thought, I'm just going to stop myself, and, and I'll, it'll be fine. I just, it won't come out of my, my mouth. The things that come out of our mouth, they start in our heart. It's not just a matter of an attitude change. Attitude change is part of it. Don't get me wrong. But slander comes from the bitter root in the heart. That's where the problem is. So that's where we've got to deal with it. This is where we go, we go straight there when we're going to confess our sins before the Lord. Confess the, the realities of our heart. You may, you may have heard other people, when they're talking about repentance, they, they uh, define it as, as turning and going the other way. And that's, that's right. But we're not just talking about turning from the action. But, but turning from a way of thinking. The flip side of repentance is faith. They always go hand in hand. Repentance and faith always go hand in hand. You're safe in Jesus' arms to confess. Okay? Let me just say that. And if you're scared, it's okay. God, you're safe in Jesus' arms. I want to read to you exactly how you can know that. Okay? You can know that you're safe to confess these things before Jesus. In Jesus, before the Father, that is. This is from the Gospel of Luke. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. 
Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. And they cast lots and divided his garments, and the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him. He saved others. Let him save himself if he's the Christ, his chosen one. The soldiers mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. And there was an inscription over him, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. Every bit of the, the ways that you have experienced slander, you've been on the receiving end, in every way, in every bit of the way that you have inflicted it on somebody else, all of that was taken up by Jesus. All of it. That's how you know that you can go to him. That's how you know that you can go to him. Now, particularly if, if the, the other person, if that person is a Christian... I want to also clue you into another reality. Paul says in Romans 8, Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. Jesus is at the right hand of God, speaking a, speaking a word of truth, a good word over his people. And if you feel like you are free to slander one of God's children, you're calling Jesus a liar. That's how serious this is. But I want you to consider what Jesus is doing for you right now. He doesn't slander. He doesn't gossip. He doesn't abuse. He intercedes and he speaks for you. He defends you. So what if right now you look to Jesus Instead of just trying to change what's going on in your head, you actually look to Jesus and put off the old and put on the new. I think this is what we would find. At just practically speaking, the outworking of that sort of, that sort of correction to our worship also has the effect of when we go from here, we, we don't feel compelled to slander other people we feel compelled to defend. And we can because we are in Christ. We can speak grace because we can speak grace because what God really wants is to deliver. Because he is mighty and he is gracious. Put off the old. Put on the new. doesn't matter if it's here or if it's out there. Consider who God is as we speak and we speak about each other. And even as those thoughts come into your head, cling to Jesus. Cling to Jesus. He has overcome for you. God, we thank you. We thank you for those truths. We thank you that Jesus has truly overcome. That Jesus has truly paid and, and taken up the slander that, that we still even hold in our hearts. And he can wash us clean. He has washed us clean. We thank you. God, let that truth about who you are, about your grace and your mercy, your desire to save, let that truth permeate every moment and every second of our lives that we would no longer feel the need to lash out because we are completely secure in a God who loves and saves and welcomes and wants us. You need nothing. Oh, hallelujah, God, you need nothing. You just love. And you are just. And you are perfect. And we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.